Great, thank you for having me. Um, so today, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some new procedures that are done in interventional mm -hmm. reality. Um, particularly new emerging procedures and technologies that uh, for the treatment of prostate and kidney disease. I'm going to provide a brief overview of prostate artery embolization for benign prostatic hyperplasia in patients with lower urinary tract symptoms. I'm also going to give you a brief overview of some new technologies used for percutaneous arteriovenous fistula creation in pat patients with end-stage renal disease. So in order to start talking about prostate artery embolization, First, it's important to understand what the prostate gland is. It's a walnut-sized structure. It's located between the bladder and the penis, and it is important for secreting fluids that help nourish and transport seminal fluid. Now, in patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, it involves benign proliferation of glandular and stromal tissue uh, in the transitional zone of the prostate. And what happens is that it causes constriction of the urethra, leading to bladder outlet obstruction and lower urinary tract symptoms. It's a very common disease that it actually increases with age. And about 70% of men over the age of 70 has this disease. And it has significant impact on patients' quality of life. Patients uh, are affected by their sleep. They wake up multiple times during the night uh, having to urinate, and also during the day as well. The typical symptoms that patients present, or they can present with are voiding symptoms. These are hesitancy or difficulty with urination. They may have a weak stream or dribble straining during urination, and incomplete bladder emptying. They also may complain of other symptoms, which we, we can categorize as storage symptoms, like urgency, uh, having multiple frequency of urination, um, peeing multiple times at night. Uh, they have pain when they pee or suprapubic pain. Now, the issues with BPH is that long-term complications can lead to urinary retention. Um, this can predispose them to urinary tract infections bladder calculi, and sometimes gross hematuria. And when it's severe enough, it can lead to renal insufficiency and even renal failure. So the mainstay treatment of BPH is usually with medical therapy, uh, with alpha-1 antagonists like prazosin or 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride. And these are usually for treatment of mild to moderate uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. In patients uh, who have um, their scoring of the international prostatic symptomatic, symptomatic score, they usually see improvement about three to seven points, and they're often used in combination with each other. Uh, the issues with these is that they can have significant adverse effects, including retrograde ejaculation and orthostatic hypotension in, in patients with alpha-1 antagonists. Um, they can also have loss of libido or erectile dysfunction uh, with 5 alproductase inhibitors. Now, the gold standard treatment for uh, BPH is transurethral resection of the prostate. Um, as shown in this video clip here, it's a, you know, it's a procedure that's done by urology where they get transurethral access and essentially coring out the inner uh, portions of the prostate to create a, a, a larger lumen. It's usually used for prostates up to about eight, 80 to 100 uh, cubic centimeters and does have significant improvement in patients' IPSS scores. You see usually a 15 to 16 point improvement and marked urinary uh, improvement flow rates as well. The issues with it is that it is associated with about 20% uh, complications, including ejaculatory dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, uh, and since they're going transurethral, there could be injury to the urethra, leading to urethral strictures, uh, urethral retention, and, and, and sometimes um, blood loss requiring transfusion. For patients with very large prostates, using about greater than 80 to 100 centimeters, cubic centimeters, open prostatectomy has been the historical gold standard. This has also significant improvement in patients' IPSS scores between 13 and 18 points. But it does come with significant morbidities, including major bleeding, uh, sepsis, uh, urinary tract infection, urinary retention, uh, urine incontinence, and also because um, it can also cause injury to the urethra as well and cause urethral stricture. Now, over uh, time, there has been development of more minimally invasive surgical therapies uh, called MISTs. Uh, these include transurethral microwave therapy, prostatic urethral lifts, uh, water vapor ther thermal therapy and green light laser therapy. And all of these um, procedures, they all function to destroy or displace the obstructing prostatic tissue. Now, they do have significant less morbidity than uh, TERP and open prostatectomy, but they also have less improvement in patients' IPSS scores and higher rates of retreatment. Uh, they're not recommended for larger prostates uh, and also have variable effects for patients with more prominent median lobes. 
They do require transurethral access. So again, potential injuries to the urethra um, can cause urethral strictures or bladder neck stenosis, and that can ultimately lead to urinary incontinence and require bladder catheterization. Now, prostate artery embolization is a procedure that is developed by interventional radiologists uh, for minimally invasive treatment for lower urinary tract symptoms that are attributed to BPH. It essentially involves embolization or blockage of the prostatic arteries, which leads to ischemia and reduction of the uh, prostate gland. It also causes reduction of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors that leads to smooth muscle relaxation. Now, this has been studied uh, since the early 2000s, and it's been uh, multiple publications on uh, this procedure, including randomized controlled trials, uh, comparative studies, cohort studies and meta-analysis, as well as review articles. And essentially, uh, to sum up the literature, over 23 studies from 11 countries, more than 2,000 patients um, with BPH with lower urinary tract symptoms, it has shown that prostate artery embolization uh, has an effective improvement in patients' IPSS scores between 10 to 18 points, and it is safe with minor um, major complications and 0.5% of patients. Um, there's been studies up to six and a half years showing um, good uh, midterm follow-up results. Uh, and in patients who either have failure of prostate artery embolization, they can have the option of urological treatment um, as well as a repeat prostate artery embolization uh, with um, good results. Now, this is just to highlight um, one of the more recent studies that came out. Uh, this is a uh, inferiority random, randomized trial where they essentially randomized 45 patients to prostate artery embolization versus TERP. Uh, and what they found was that there was improvement in patients' urinary uh, flow rate, which is Qmax, and improvement in their pulmonary um, prostate volume reduction, and that was more with TERP. But however, when they looked at IPSS scores and quality of life improvements, um, patients had better improvement uh, with prostate artery embolization. There was also fewer adverse events with prostate artery embolization compared to TERP. This was also another recent study in 2019, um, and this is um, very interesting in the sense that there's very few trials that can compare you know, a, a, a treatment with a sham trial. Essentially, uh, what they did was they uh, randomized patients to prostate artery embolization versus a sham, which sham essentially they placed the catheters into the prostate arteries, but they did not embolize the prostate arteries. And they had 80 patients, um, 40 in the prostate artery embolization group and 40 in the sham group. Um, all these patients had severe lower urinary tract symptoms secondary to BPH. And what they found was that patients that underwent prostate artery embolization had greater improvements in their IPSS and quality of life uh, scores. Um, they also found that in, that in about six months after this, the, the sham group did undergo prostate artery embolization as well. Um, and what they found was that there was improvement uh, after prostate artery embolization in their IPSS and quality of life. And there was no difference in adverse events. Now, what are the typical uh, safety of prostate artery embolization? What are the, the, the risks associated with it? Uh, one of the common symptoms that we see is called post-embolization syndrome. And this is very similar to what we see in patients with uterine fibroids that undergo uterine artery embolization or chemoembolization for liver cancer. Essentially, patients develop uh, pain, dysuria, increased frequency, and other irritative symptoms, and usually lasts less than one week, and it's usually treated symptomatically. There is minor complications that we see less than 5% of patients, including acute urinary retention that might require um, catheterization and urinary tract infections. Uh, usually these are self-limited and, and can be uh, treated uh, post-procedure. Now, in terms of major complications, based on the prior studies, they are quite rare. Uh, there was only out of uh, 2,000 patients, six major complications as demonstrated in this table. Um, those include uh, urinary, severe urinary tract infection, bladder wall ischemia, uh, severe perineal pain, rectal ulcers, uh, bladder wall ischemia, and de novo rectal dysfunction. And most of these, as you can see in the outcome, uh, resolved on their own over time. And some of these are related to what we call non-target embolizations. Uh, one of the things that now with newer technologies and, and especially with cone beam CT that we use for our procedures, uh, we have reduced some of these complications uh, substantially. Now, this is a case uh, that, um, that was performed. It was a 73-year-old gentleman, had a history of malignant neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas that was treated, um, but also was noted to have BPH and lower urinary tract symptoms for the past eight years. He was treated medically with um, Flomax, which is uh, OP1 antagonist, and with minimal improvement. He had a severe IPSS score of 21. His quality of life score was five, which is unhappy. 
Um, we did check his PSA, which was normal. There's no evidence of prostate cancer. Uh, on exam, he had an enlarged multinodular prostate. Um, he also had a prostate biopsy again, which was negative for cancer, and his urinalysis was negative for any urinary tract infection. This was his pre-procedure CT angio that did show, you can see a large prostate and nodular, um, and his prostate already, uh, sorry, his prostate volume was about 151, so over the uh, 100 um, cubic centimeters that we see with normal uh, turf. So in terms of the prostate area embolization, this is kind of a, a cartoon animation that describes or shows you a visualization of the procedure. We can access either the groin, the common femoral artery, or the radial artery, uh, which we um, use most of the time. And we can actually place in small catheters down into the pelvic arteries and into the prostate arteries. And using tiny beads or particles, we can embolize the prostate arteries. So we usually treat on one side and then we actually can treat the um, prostate artery on the other side. And what it does is it leads to ischemia, shrinkage of the prostate gland. And you can see opening up of uh, the passage to the urethra for urine to pass from the bladder um, out to the penis. It's usually done in our interventional radiology suite. Sometimes these patients do need fully catheter placement um, prior to the procedure. We also give antibiotics before and after the procedure. And this is all done with moderate sedation. We can access, as mentioned, from the wrist uh, transradial approach. Um, this allows improved patient comfortability and also um, in terms of um, anticoagulations, some of these anticoagulations we do not need to stop for the procedure uh, if we go transradial access. We use small catheters or micro catheters to get into these tiny prostatic vessels. And this is an example kind of, of showing the perfusion to the prostate uh, with the catheter in the prostate arteries. You can see early and late uh, perfusion. And then after the embolization, you see decreased perfusion to uh, the prostate. And this is also similar findings you see on the right side. The particles that we're using are, are small in size, they're microscopic. They're usually 300 to 500 micron in size or smaller. So in this patient, he underwent prostate embolization. His follow-up after the procedure uh, was his IPS showed significant improvement from 21, uh, which was severe, down to three, which is mild. His quality of life score went from five down to, uh, to zero. And you can see on his post-procedure imaging, he has a decreased prostate volume well, from 151 down to 39. And interesting enough, as mentioned, that you can actually see, visually see areas of ischemia uh, within the prostate gland shown in this dark areas. So what are ideal candidates for prostate artery embolization? Uh, one of the things we look for is patients who can't undergo uh, surgical procedure or um, are not a candidate for a uh, miss. These are you know, patients who have um, for surgical candidates, patients who have urinary retention, um, have, have long-term indwelling bladder catheters. Um, this procedure is also used for patients who have uh, refractory hematuria of prostatic origin. So this may be, for example, from traumatic foliar injury with, uh, with um, chronic um, bleeding and tr requiring transfusions. Patients who had poor surgical, prior surgical history, so they may have had a, a TERP that has failed, um, may be potential candidates for prostate embolization. Uh, also, large prostates, again, those patients who are not a candidate for TERP uh, and who may not want open prostatectomy. Um, and then in terms of exclusion, uh, patients, uh, we don't perform this procedure for patients with prostate cancer uh, or patients who have unsuitable vascular anatomy, um, like vascular artery uh, atherosclerotic disease or occlusion that's severe that they may have chronic occlusion of the prostate arteries. Uh, patients who are renal insufficient uh, or have severe uh, acute renal failure. Uh, patients with urethral strictures or other causes of, of symptoms of, of low urinary tract symptoms, including bl large bladder stones or urinary tract infections. We, re we recommend treating these first. So in conclusion, just about prostate area embolization, and there's kind of a, 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 a run through, um, but just wanted to, to, to highlight this new procedure that is safe and has been shown to be uh, effective and for the minimally invasive treatment of, of low urinary tract symptoms related to BPH. It has shown good short-term and mid-term durability up to six and a half years. Um, and based on these new randomized controlled trials, it does show that they have similar results to TERP uh, with fewer adverse events. Now, before I start there, I want to just uh, um, open this up to any questions that you have uh, about prostate artery embolization, and then we can potentially talk, we can go to our next uh, portion on um, percutaneous arterial venous fistula creation.
If not, we can also okay. save the questions at the end as well. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next portion of the talk. And again, if there's any questions that do come up, um, feel free to put them in the chat box um, for, um, for me to review. Okay, the next part I want to talk to you about is, is kidney disease. Um, this might be relevant to, to some of you in your practice out there, but as you know, kidney disease in the United States uh, is a very common disorder. It affects about one in seven um, patients or people in the United States. That equates about 15% of the U.S. adults and 37 million people. Uh, and it's, it's a disease that affects um, patients as they increase in age, especially patients 65 years and older. And it's not just a disease in the United States, it's a disease world, uh, prevalent disease worldwide. Uh, about 2.3 million people in the world have end-stage renal disease, and that is increasing uh, by 7% annually. Now, what's the current problems with patients with end-stage renal disease? Uh, well, patients sometimes need immediate hemodialysis access, and central venous dialysis catheters um, are usually placed. Um, we place them um, in our interventional suites, and they, they do have benefits in providing immediate access, but they also come with increased risk of infection and overall cost. Um, there's about two to three-fold increased risk of hospitalization related to infection and death uh, for tunnel dialysis catheters compared to AV fistulas and AV crabs. And that equates about 1.1 to 1.5 episodes of catheter-related bloodstream infections per 1,000 catheter days. So the longer these catheters are, um, that these catheters are in patients, the higher the risk of infection. Now, surgical AV fistulas or AV grafts um, are the preferred method for hemodialysis. They decrease, they have a decreased risk of infection uh, compared to tunnel dialysis catheter. But for surgical AV fistulas, there is longer times for maturation. Um, it can take over three months before a surgical AV fistula can be used. Uh, this is an example of a surgical AV fistula creation. Uh, this is done in the OR, usually with either a local or an anesthesia. Um, they make an incision uh, in the arm to get access into the vessels. After dissecting down and, and avoiding injury to any other vessels or, or nerves, they, get, they eventually um, identify the the, the artery that they're making their incision. They have to clamp their arteries before to get hemostatic control. And then after making that incision, and they actually form an anastomosis. Uh, you can see the um, surgical sutures. You can also again see the clamping and that's the, if they've created a anastomosis between the artery and the vein, they can release the clamps and they have a, a surgical AV fistula. Now, the current problems with surgical AV fistula is that there is high primary failure rate, about 23% of patients. And these fistulas require multiple reinterventions, um, use about three to four interventions per year to maintain uh, their, their function. There's also a one year primary patency rate of surgical AV fistula is only between 43 to 55%. Um, so, again, there even though they are um, beneficial in, the, in terms of decreasing infection, they can provide hemodialysis access, you require um, time um, for them to be used. Now, newer technologies have come out. This is uh, since 2018, um, percutaneous AV fistulas. Uh, there's two um, types of technologies out there in the market today. This is one of them. It's called the Ellipsis system. Uh, this is one that we use currently at the University of Maryland. Um, this is an FDA approved, it's a single catheter system that works over the wire. Uh, it requires only venous access. Everything's done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, and it uses a low thermal energy um, to create a fusion between the artery and the vein. And there's essentially no implant that's left behind. So there's no surgical sutures or staples. Um, and essentially, this is how the procedure is done. It's done all as an outpatient setting, um, but we can access one of the veins, perforating vein under ultrasound guidance, and from under ultrasound guidance, from the perforating vein, enter into the proximal radial artery. Once we have access into the radial artery, you can place a wire to maintain access, and then we place in a vascular teeth um, that goes over the wire, and it goes through the perforating vein into that proximal radial artery, and so we have access between the two vessels. We remove the, the inner dilator, and over that wire, we place in um, this ellipsis catheter. As you can see, it has kind of one portion of the catheter is gonna go into the artery and the other portion is gonna go into the vein. 
as demonstrated here. And essentially, it acts as somewhere like a spot welder, where it, using thermal energy, it burns and fuses the artery and vein together. Again, this is all done under ultrasound guidance, so there's no x-ray or fluoroscopy. Um, it's all under image guidance. And so you essentially created an osmosis and fused fusion between the two vessels to allow blood flow from the proximal radial artery to go into the perforating vein and into the uh, supervisual system of the arm and creating arteriovenous fistula. We also balloon that anastomosis at the time of creation. Uh, and then everything's removed and a patient leaves home with a Band-Aid. It takes about 15 to 30 minutes for the actual procedure. So it's a minimally invasive procedure. It creates a automated side-to-side -side anastomosis between the two vessels. As you can see, there's no, as with surgical aid fistulas, manipulation of the vessels. Uh, there's no trauma in terms of clamping. Everything's done using the patient's own anatomy. There's no foreign material, no sutures or staples that are left behind, and it doesn't have the typical, you know, traditional surgical incision. So this has been, you know, studied since 2017. Actually, the the lead author, Dr. Hall, uh, who helped create this device, was an interventional radiologist. Um, he actually um, studied did several trials in the U.S. There was also um, trials done in, in Europe as well, and the more recent. Um, study I'll, I'll, I'll highlight, but I just want to kind of just talk to you about what they found in their initial studies. They found excellent uh, functional patency at one year, about 92 to 94%. Um, patients were able to get uh, two needle dialysis, which is ultimately what uh, they need for uh, hemodialysis, and it was about 88%. There was also improved time to cannulation, meaning patients can get hemodialysis, uh, functional hemodialysis earlier, uh, as early as 10 days, but on average, usually six weeks. Um, this is faster than compared to surgical aid fistulas, where it takes you know, kind of be up to three months before a working fistula can be used. Since it's a smaller diameter hole, um, uh, it creates a less, there's less risk for steel syndrome um, that you can see with surgical aid fistulas. There's also reduction in AV fistula failures to 5%. And there's less need for reinterventions um, because, again, there's less trauma to these vessels that you see with surgical aid fistulas um, that you don't get the just anastomotic stenosis that you typically see with surgical aid fistulas related to or, or uh, abnormal um, anastomotic uh, connection between the vessels. So there's there's definitely less interventions in this. I'll show you that have have effects with patients um, in terms of uh, cost uh, for them in the hospital. And there's also higher safety profiles. Um, this was a two-year cumulative patency uh, study that was done. Um, it was a retrospective analysis looking at two years. Um, this is the largest so far of, of um, longest term study so far that we have. It was published in 2020 this year. Uh, it looked at five, five vascular access centers in the United States, over 105 patients. And what they found was that uh, patients after the procedure uh, had a physi physiologically mature AV fissure. What that means is that the fistula had uh, greater than five millimeter diameter. There was uh, over 500 milliliters per minute flow uh, and 98% of these fistulas. But what's important is that the clinical uh, functional AV fistula, being fistulas that can actually be used for hemodiasis, they found that was successful in 95% of patients. They had eight uh, cases of, of failures or failure to mature out of the 105 patients. And their overall cumulative patency, so you can see at six months, it was about 97%. And up to two years, it was about 92% um, percent or 93% uh, um, at 24 months. So it does show um, you know, good cumulative patency compared to uh, surgical AV fistulas that have been previously published. And they did also a, a survey uh, after the procedure about patient satisfaction, and they found that patients had a high level of, of satisfaction related to this procedure, um, especially you know, patients enjoy the, the cosmetic effect of seeing that there's no large incision that they um, would have if they underwent a surgical AV fistula. So in terms of uh, patient benefits, um, so one of the things, so this is kind of the traditional timeline of a patient getting a surgical AV fistula, uh, where they, you know, from day zero, they may have their hemodialysis catheter placed, they may get me referred up to 15 days to 30 days um, before they finally see a surgeon. It could take them to, a, you know, a month before seeing a vascular uh, access surgeon. Uh, and then the time that this actually created, it may take an additional uh, you know, three months or more uh, for a, a, a fistula to be um, workable. So you can you can imagine up to 90 days before a patient um, can get a working fistula. 
And there's also multiple visits they have to see. Um, you know, if they need anesthesia, they may have to see an anesthesiologist. Uh, they're going to need um, vein mapping and surgical consultation. And um, so possibly reducing these, these steps by doing a percutaneous AV fistula can help get their access uh, much quicker uh, and also, um, you know, reduce the number of catheter days uh, that they have a tunnel dialysis catheter. Um, this is all done as an outpatient procedure. The procedure is fairly short, about 10 to 15 minutes for the actual uh, procedure, plus or minus, you know, recovery time. Uh, and this is a good option for patients who, you know, are, are either can't get a surgical wavy fistula or want other options. In terms of um, additional benefits, you know, the patients leave with a Band-Aid. There's no surgical scar uh, or disfigurements that sometimes you can see with, you know, surgical wavy fistulas um, secondary to the procedure. Now, in terms of uh, hospital benefits, there, there was a study that looked at uh, endovascular creation of AV fistulas versus for a surgical AV fistula, it takes about four interventions per year to maintain them. And this has significant long-term costs. You know, over one year can cost up to $14,000 uh, to maintain this uh, fistula. Compared to an endovascular fistula, um, which takes about less than one intervention or 0.46 interventions per year, you can see the cost is much reduced in terms of about, it's about only, a, you know, $1,000 to to maintain this fistula. So by having you know fewer uh, re-interventions, it can help lower the cost uh, to both the patient and to the healthcare system. Additional benefits is that um, you know with catheters, there are multiple issues that can happen. You can have catheter occlusions, infection, and all these leads to increased hospitalization uh, and cost as well in potential death. So if you can get patients in with a fistula faster, reduce the number of need for catheter dialysis. This potentially decrease the risk of catheter-related line infections, bacteremia, and increased hospitalization. You also can reduce the need for central venous catheter malfunction and replacement. So what are ideal candidates for percutaneous AV fistula? Um, patients that have or need long-term hemodialysis, uh, uh, patients who are not candidates or do not want to undergo surgical AV fistulas. This is a, a potential option for them, uh, especially those patients with chronic kidney disease stage four or five that may need elective hemodialysis. Usually all these patients do get vein maps um, prior to the procedure to make sure they're suitable candidates. So patients have to have uh, tar target vein diameters greater than two millimeters, as well as the proximal radio artery has to be greater than two millimeters. The distance between the two vessels also needs to be within 1.5 millimeters. This is, uh, limitations of the device to make sure that the artery and vein are close together for anastomosis. Uh, and they should have a life expectancy greater than uh, one year. So in conclusion, with uh, percutaneous AV fistula, it is a new and uh, innovative technology um, that does so far, you know, up to two years, provide a reliable and functional vascular access. Um, further studies, of course, um, are currently, um, you know, being worked out and, and looking at these the longer term uh, impact of these this new technology. Uh, it does provide a quicker access for AV fistula creation and the benefits to patients, you know, in terms of not only quicker ac access, but also um, you don't have the typical incision or scar that you see with surgical AV fistulas. And there's shown excellent two-year cumulative patency and high level of patient satisfaction. So with that, I just wanted to conclude